This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. Bashir, Yasser, and Giaf emerged from the bus into a hot, glaring world at once bizarre and familiar. They could see the old municipality building and the town cinema and the edge of the neighborhood where they were raised. But none of the streets seemed familiar, at least not at first. They all had new names. Most of the old buildings were covered with brightly colored signs and blocky, indecipherable Hebrew lettering. On some of the building archways, the remnants of the original flowing Arabic cursive remained. Suddenly, Yasser, the eldest, spotted something he knew, the old neighborhood butcher's shop. He quickly walked inside, his cousins following, and threw his arms around the butcher, kissing both his cheeks in the customary way of the Arabs. Abu Muhammad! Yasser shouted in glee. Don't you recognize me? Habibi, my dear friend, I recognize you. We meet again. The Jewish butcher could not have been more startled. Abu Muhammad had left many years before. You are right, Habibi, the man told Yasser, stammering awkwardly in the language of his visitor. Once there was Abu Muhammad. Now no more Abu Muhammad. Now Mordechai. The butcher invited his guests to stay for kebab, but the cousins were too stunned by the man's true identity and too distracted by their own mission to accept this offer of food. They walked out, flustered. You were pretending you knew everything here, he asked, teased his older cousin as they left the shop. You don't know anything here. The three men turned a corner and found themselves in the quieter streets of the neighborhood where they once played. They felt at ease and happy, and they forgot their earlier admonitions about speaking to one another and conversed openly in their mother tongue. They came upon Yasser's house and approached the door. Yasser stepped forward to knock. A woman in her forties came out, looking at them strangely. Please, said Yasser, all we want is to see the house we lived in before. The woman grew agitated. If you don't leave the house, I will call the police, she screamed. The cousins tried to calm her, explaining their purpose. The woman continued shouting, taking a step forward and shoving them back. Neighbors began opening their doors. Eventually, the cousins realized they might soon find themselves in trouble with the local authorities, and they retreated in haste. Yasser drifted along in a silent daze. It was as if he had no soul, Bashir recalled. He was a walking body, nothing more. I cannot accept such a feeling, Yasser said finally. It's something that I really cannot bear. Soon they came upon the house where Yath had grown up. Outside was a large sign they couldn't read and a guard armed with a machine gun. The two-story stone house was now a school. The guard told the men to wait while he went inside, and a moment later the principal came out and invited them in for tea. She introduced herself. Her name was Shulamit. She told them they could walk through the rooms when the class period ended, and she left them in her office to wait. There they sat, silently sipping their tea. Hyath removed his glasses and wiped his eyes. He put them back on and tried to look cheerful. I can't control my feelings, he whispered. I know, Bashir said quietly. I understand. When the principal returned, she invited them to tour the house. They did so, Hyath crying the whole time. After their visit, they left the house and walked in the direction of Bashir's old home. No one could remember exactly where it was. Bashir recalled that it had both a front door and a back door that faced a side street. It had a front gate with a bell, a flowering fitna or plumeria tree in the front yard, and a lemon tree in the back. After walking in circles in the heat, Bashir realized he'd found the house. He heard a voice from somewhere deep inside himself. This is your home. Bashir and his cousins approached the house. Everything depended on the reception, Bashir told himself. You can't know what the outcome will be, especially after what had happened to Yasser. It depends, he said, who is on the other side of the door. Dahlia sat in a plain wooden chair on the back veranda of the only home she had ever known. She had no special plan for today. She could catch up on her summer reading for the university, or she studied English literature. Or she could peer contentedly into the depths of the jacaranda tree, as she had done countless times before. Bashir stood at the metal gate, looking for the bell. How many times, he wondered, did his mother, Zakia, walk through this same gate? 
How many times did his father, Ahmad, pass by, coming home tired from work, rapping his knuckles on the front door in his special knock of arrival? Bashir Hayri reached for the bell and pressed it.